Let us pray. Have a seat. You have a seat. You may be seated. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather here today to reflect on you, to bless you, to bless, to praise you, and thank you for our blessings that we receive from you for the beautiful day, the hint of sun, the rain that keeps us keeps us watered and taken care of for all that you do for us. We thank you. In God's name we pray. Amen. Today's um, first reading comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 126. And if you want to follow along in your, prayer, in your Bible, to Pew Bible today, it's on page 499. When the, Lord when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seeds for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going there 
there to meet my Savior. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I'll soon be free from every trial. This form shall rest beneath the side. I'll drop the cross of self-denial and into in the home with God. I'm going home to see my Savior. I'm going home no more to roam. I'm I'm only going over home. I am a poor, wayfaring stranger, wandering through this world of woe. But there's no sorrow, no toil, no danger in that bright land. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over something here. Anybody know what this is? A car. A car? But this is a very special car. Does it look familiar? No. Any of you? Uh, Transformer. Yeah, let's see. Somehow that this is supposed to switch here. Let's see what we can do. What do we have? Whoa. It's Bumblebee. Is it Bumblebee? Yeah. It is indeed. It's a car? Is that a car? Transformer car. It's a transformer car. What does a transformer do? Transformer? Transformer, what does that mean? It becomes something else. Yeah, transform comes from the word trans, which means to thoroughly change and form shape. Today, Reverend Kay is going to talk about a little bit, one of their Bible verses up here, it's, it was up here earlier, anyway, says in the Bible, that Paul in the book of Romans is telling the, um, the followers that is there that they need to transform their minds, not to, con not to conform to society, but transform their minds. Can you imagine what that might mean to transform your mind? Turn your mind around into things. And I have two. I have another transformer here. This is, what's his name? Do you know this one? I think it's Blaze. Yeah, the Blaze Master. And he transforms from a, from a helicopter into a bit of a weapon that is used by, he works together with, Bumblebee. Now, I'm not really good at this. I have not had a lot of practice with transforms. That one? Well, anyway, we'll work with this later. But he goes up here, and he's got another one. This other side comes out here, and he 
uses it as weapons and shoots it off. All right? And in a way, I think that's maybe what Paul's talking about. We transform our minds and work together for something better for God. So let's think about that. Well, how can we transform ourselves to do and become God's people? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all you've given us. Thank you for the original transformer, your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for all the messages you give us and help us to puzzle through how we can transform ourselves into becoming your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. scripture lesson is from uh, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. If you think about that particular letter, it's very dense theologically for 11 chapters. And then suddenly it breaks open and it's almost understandable. Well, I wanted it to be completely understandable this morning, so I'm doing a little verse-by-verse -verse experiment with it. I'm going to have Valerie be up here, and she will be doing the explanation. She'll be reading from the message, which is a paraphrase of Scripture. A paraphrase means it's not a word-by-word -word translation, but someone has taken the time to chisel away at the Greek and turn it into everyday language that we can understand. So let's in, in, indulge a little bit in uh, rather, well, the beginning of an easier part of Paul's letter to the church in Romans. It's in the 12th chapter. And Valerie, come up and I'll step down. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard. I don't know if that's what you have before you or even if you have it before you, do you? Okay. And we're only doing one through five because Valerie has so much to say. <laughs> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual practice. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings you, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more of, your, more of, your, of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No. 
God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for God. For as the one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually, we are members of one another. In this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body, but as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be, without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you, saints of Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. It's a privilege to be with you this morning, and I greet you as a member congregation of National Capital Presbytery, and I thank you for allowing me to minister on your behalf. Actually, having the title of Interim Associate General Presbyter means that you're my employer. So this is a little bit like the boss coming and doing a check-in, and you get to check in on the boss itself. Um, you know, you provide my salary through the mission funds, so I have an interest in you having a really good experience in worship this morning. But because my, um, my relationship and my responsibilities are so varied, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what I do. I have two main responsibilities, and one is the mission coordinating committee, and the other is church development. So mission coordinating involves advocacy, which means our witness in the public square. It involves all variety of charitable activities, whether they happen through community organizations or through our congregations. It's the ecumenical and interfaith relationships, ministries with young adults on four different campuses and with the new PCUSA Young Adult Volunteer Site that's opening next week in Washington, D.C. It's a very exciting moment for us. And of course, with all of the local and global mission work that our congregations and presbytery supports. So my work is to hold all of these passions together and to distribute and sort of process and guide the presbytery's support to all of these activities. That could be enough for one person, but I also have church development. And church development covers the full cycle from, of church life, from the seeding, nurturing, growing of new congregations to accompanying immigrant congregations as they seek and find their place within National Capital Presbytery, to the ever essential work of renewing and reinvigorating congregations, the provisions of leadership development for individuals within churches and for whole congregational ministries, and even to the care of congregations facing the conclusion of their witness and life. So I also greet you as a co-worker. 
Mount Vernon is a part of my work, especially through your pastor, Bob Malone, who's a member of Church Development Committee for National Capital Presbytery. And I want you to tell you that his involvement is significant, and I count it a privilege to minister with him. I also, as you see, greet you as family. And I deeply appreciate that Lance and Val and Elliot and Tavish have a home here at Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. I know you care for them, as I do, as a family does. And I trust that care to sustain each of them in their everyday lives in faith. So, I greet you as a family member, I greet you as a co-worker, and I greet in the gospel, and I greet you as a companion on Christ's way. Because my presence with you this morning is multifaceted, I thought it wise to use a broad approach in order to consider Paul's words to Romans on what does it mean to be the body of Christ, especially the transforming body of Christ. Now, we've already heard Paul's advice twice, or three times if you count the children's sermon. Now allow me to quote one other voice as we begin. In order to remain faithful, in the present and coming age, all churches must learn to change and adapt. We follow a living God and recognize that the lives of our congregations are called to be constantly transforming. Transformation is the heart of the gospel. Too often, church leaders substitute the institutional work of the church or the critical transformation work that is always required. But church leadership is about so much more than leading weekly worship services, putting together a Sunday school program, scheduling choir rehearsals, and holding monthly committee meetings. Churches do not exist to manage religious business, but rather to partner with Christ, in, with the Spirit in growing people in Christ. Now, this is the quiz. Do those words sound authentic in your ears? They ought to. Your pastor wrote them. This summer, I was away for a brief period of time, and our committee had to uh, get a grant proposal ready to go. And quite frankly, I said, I'm not available. I I'm not going to be here. Somebody else has to do this. And people were looking around the committee table. I know you don't know anything about that, because here at Mount Vernon, everybody steps forward the minute a challenge is put out there. Well, at least that's what it, ha it seems to be. So um, only Bob, who's only been on the committee for about a half year, said, oh, okay, I'll do that. And without any assistance from anybody, produced the per first part of the grant in the most remarkable way. So he was very, very helpful. So our new program will be called The Well, and it's a congregational two-year program to provide resources and direction probably to eight congregations within the presbytery in order to develop a positive attitude towards change and enthusiastically adapt to becoming transforming members of Christ's body. We have great hope for the well. And your pastor was a great part of that hope taking shape. So I thank him for that. Thus, the big picture for this particular story 
begins with the words change, adapt, and transform. And since Paul's inspiring us this morning, we might say, and there abide, change, adapt, and transform. But the greatest of these is transform. So allow me a quick definition of what it means to transform. Transform is the bulb becoming a flower, the acorn, an oak tree, the child, an adult, or even a ragtime collection of believers, a committed community. Transform is as soft as a baby's coo or as firm as the EMT's lift. Transform surprises as a butterfly breaking out of an ugly old cocoon or the last smile on a dying one's face. Transform is the wayfaring stranger finding home. Transform is that shift of darkness to radiance, of cacophony to holy silence, of terror to courage, of conflict to love. Transform is, as, is manifest as adaption and then becomes change. And finally, most significantly, breaks into exactly what God intends. Transform is God's intention for good for every human being and institution, especially the beloved community of Christ. A fair question for me as a church development specialist might be, does this word transform describe the contemporary church? Well, I have to admit that from my perspective, transform is not the first word that springs to mind when considering the contemporary church in general or in our presbytery. What I hear congregations saying too much of the time is something like, oh, we're doing okay. We're sort of keeping on. Some lament the good old days and particularly the good old balanced budgets. Some fret over the lack of young adults or youth or men or other nationalities or whatever. Others are frustrated by a changing cultural context inside the church as well as outside the church and sometimes on every side of the church. A few are preparing to fold up the tent and conclude their life as a witness in the Presbyterian, witness as a Presbyterian church. These days, the words change, adapt, and transform hardly ever enter the conversation. And if they come in, it's only as challenge or deficit. And yet, based on Romans 12, change, adapt, transform, and especially transform are the best indications that a congregation is alive in Jesus Christ. And isn't that what you desire to be? 
a body alive in Jesus Christ? I know that's what I desire for Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church. It's what I desire for every congregation in our Presbyterian, in our whole denomination, in the whole worldwide church of Jesus Christ. But sadly, we no longer think about church life in terms of adapt, change, and transform. Rather, we bemoan our circumstances saying, well, the church resists change these days. It's stuck in yesterday's culture. It's afraid of the future. I think it's afraid of the present. But perhaps the strongest indictment of the church today comes not from inside the church, but from outside. You already know this phrase. I'm spiritual, but not religious. This is sadly the number one reason people give for ignoring and leaving the church. It, in its crudest, cruelest translation, it says something like this, so I'm spiritual and not religious means something like this. The church has ceased to be a spiritual home. No one's there. Now, most church people are mildly put, put off and offended by this phrase. Some say in response, in the church, we're in favor of spiritual religion not religion separated from spirit. And we expend a lot of energy belittling those spiritual but, but not religious folks. But I have a different option. Instead of resisting what they're saying, why not explore this judgment? Because I have a hunch that it might bring us a healthy dose of self-awareness and repentance. Now, I admit I base this on a hunch, not on any cultural scientific survey. My hunch is, for many of us, the church we know is slightly or greatly disconnected from the faith we hold and have and experience and value. Although we honor the church because we personally received Christ's mercy, love, and redemption through the church, we still know something of that yearning expressed in George and Lance's duet this morning. We are the poor wayfaring stranger journeying with difficulties, looking for a home with eyes fixed on a complete and perfect life with God. So friends, when we're honest, just as those outside the church long for a spirituality, and they long for it unencumbered by the structures of the church, we inside the church long for God's spiritual presence here and now. As brothers and sisters, we know something is missing, something for which we deeply long. Quite frankly, the church, with all its programs and activity, is failing to bring the divine presence in a palpable way to folks like and unlike us. This, I think, is the critical insight for the contemporary church. 
and an insight I believe your pastor supported when he wrote, we follow a living God and recognize that the lives of our congregations are called to be continually, constantly transforming. Churches do not exist to manage religious business, but rather to partner with the Spirit in growing people in Christ. So here's what I see. I see you. I see you gathered in worship, attentive to God's words, singing God's praises, and by your presence in this service of worship on the penultimate summer of Sunday of summer, you declare, though the church in general may be in a mess these days, your congregation in particular is not dead. Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church may not be perfect institution. It may not be a fully vibrant body of Christ, but you are a place where people can gather knowing that spirituality is alive. And that's something to build on. So back to Paul's words in the message to the Romans. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. Your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. I want the same for you. To begin by embracing what God is doing right here, right now. I pray you will see Mount Vernon Presbyterian, at, with all of its dimples and warts, as God-shaped, God-protected, God-directed, and God-delighted. This is now the spiritual stuff that Paul has hidden in his words today. This is the good news. It means Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church, along with every church, at this very moment, is a pleasing offering to God. According to Paul, the first step in being a church continuously transformed into the body of Christ is seeing yourself as God sees you, and then giving yourself as a beautiful, not a paltry, offering back to God. That's my first, my last, and my only word for today. I'm telling you this because I know you'll be hearing the word transform from this pulpit many times over the next few years. And I want you to be ready for that word and for all that comes through it. It's the good news of today. Romans' path towards beginning the tr being the transformed body of Christ is simply this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you 
can do for God. I don't know if this works. Thank you. And now unto God, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish more than we can think or dream. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. our time for offering. Our text led us towards offering, so let's do it as though that is something God has given us to do.
Well, let's hear what's on your mind that needs prayers this morning. What do we need to pray about? A contented group of Christians. Yes. <laughs> Attitudes, concerns for family, aunt and uncle, and for a friend named Vicki. Yes? Kayla? Caitlin is starting her senior year in college. Ooh, think of the prayers next year. <laughs> uh -huh. Carol Morrison, that's maybe a member here. Her mom has died this last week. Keep her in our prayers. Yes? All right, Don and Kathy. Who, who are Don and Kathy? Right here? You're just commissioned to be missionaries wherever you go. <laughs> Take the good spirit that you've received here and use it in, in the new place that, to which you go. school teacher <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> I was raised by a school teacher I know that season any others yes places of conflict and for those who are working to Keep and restore and bring peace. Yes. Um, I noticed going around the ALS bucket challenge that I noticed that our own minister thought the Lord completed it, but I hope that others, instead of wasting the water, actually open up their hearts and give um, the gifts for the research to help these people. The uh, AL, A L S, right? challenge of which I've just received. <laughs> I didn't even tell George, <laughs> he may get it next, <laughs> um, is, an, is going around and you may know people who have had that disease or been caregivers to it. It's really, really a crucially painful um, and life altering, but sometimes an amazing journey. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit and be among us as we pray. Settle our hearts on you so that we can see our world as you see it. So that freed from the bad news of our media, we can feel the good news of your work among us. We do indeed lift up prayers for our troubled world. We can name so many places where terror and violence reign. We also know that wherever that is happening, the seeds of Christian faith have been planted and have produced fruit. So we pray not only for the places and the situations of war, but we pray for those who in the midst of war witness to peace, particularly those in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan, in Syria and Jordan and Israel and Palestine, in the Ukraine area, in Africa, where we also pray for those who are afflicted by the Ebola crisis and all those who put their life in harm's way in order to help others. We pray for our nation, 
particularly that our nation may have a renewed commitment to peace, specifically racial and interracial peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our schools and institutions, in our government. We pray for those who live on our borders, for they know most poignantly the hope and the horror that exists. Transform us into a nation that can be a neighbor to those near and far. We pray for our friends and families, for those that we know to be in stress and are healing, for those who are struggling with alienation and sadness, for those with mental or physical illnesses or limitations, we know you can work in their lives and we pray that for each of them. This is a particular time when families experience that shift from summer to the school routines. Be in every home. Bless every kindergartner on his or her way off to school. Be with all of the school age children and youth particularly with the college age youth and with those who will be working with them this year, give inspiration and hope in such abundance and that they'll see through their limitations to that wonderful vision of children growing to youth, growing to young adults, growing to mature adults. Let them be part of that journey. And we pray for the Church of Jesus Christ, for that beautiful, wild, and worldwide expression of faith, which we glimpse a portion of through immigrants who bring us the flavors of faith. We pray for the church in our churches in our nations nation that we might learn to live together as brothers and sisters in one communion in Christ. We pray for our own Presbyterian denomination, that as a people committed and rooted in the Reformed tradition, we'll continue our values of being advocates in the mar marketplace and public square of speaking up, of learning and educating, of being joyful in our worship and in our service. Bring us together as a healed denomination. And great God, send your spirit as a transforming dynamic in every congregation including this congregation of Mount Vernon. Bless its pastor. Bring him back restored in body and in mind. Give him such a brightness for the future that everyone will know here is a place where you can meet God and feel the Spirit at work. And now trusting in the guidance of your Son, and in his redeeming words saying, you will indeed know I am with you whenever the Spirit cries, Father. Let's pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now I am in his kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Our closing hymn is number 400. Um, might be nice to sing the last refrain of the last line each time in Spanish. One thing that I noticed about your sanctuary, you don't have a clock in it. Do you know what a sense of freedom that gives to a pastor? It's very dangerous, at least when a visiting pastor comes on. You should put a clock on. <laughs> no, I think that is a really good sign about what kind of a congregation you really are. I always ask a pastor when I get to preach to his or her congregation if there's maybe one little thing they might want me to mention that they really can't say. And I asked Bob, and he thought. He thought for a while, he thought a little bit while, more. He said no. <laughs> so I think that's another really good indication about what's happening here at Mount Vernon. Uh, I do indeed thank you, and I hope that, um, well, at least one more time before we leave in about a year, we'll be back in worship to be with uh, Lance and Val and the family um, on a Sunday morning. So my friends, now go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the suffering. Help the needy. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, our dear creator, Christ, our brother and savior, and the Holy Spirit, the communion who gives us and keeps us in Christ's way will go with you now and forevermore.
Amen.